Okay, welcome back to the Labrador Energy Podcast online version via Zoom. And uh, today we have Chris Dory. Hi, Dorian. hi, Douglas. Chris Dory, yeah, going? a good friend of mine and a collaborator, uh, partner oh, of here. Uh, how's it going, Chris? Uh, uh, quite right, yeah. Trying to deal with the situation, the whole uh, self isolation, um, which in my case is not a lot of isolating, not a lot of self involved because uh, we're here with like six people in a very tiny flat. Okay. But um, yeah. It so is how, it is. <laughs> how has the pandemic kind of caught you? Like what situation? Because in terms of self-isolation for those that don't know. Well, so what happened is um, sort of at the very outburst of it. So when it really just got started mm -hmm. uh, here in, in uh, Europe or in Germany as well, is uh, I was expecting a second child. And for that reason, my uh, girlfriend's parents, my in-laws, so to speak, uh, came in as well. And uh, that obviously affected uh, all of us because we're all uh, are staying in the same place. And then their flight got canceled. So now they're staying on for another month at mm -hmm. least. And then we'll see if that flies, that flight actually happens, which I am pessimistic about. Um, okay. So yeah, um, it's um, interesting times for sure. So you, so you got caught on lockdown with the in-laws and two young babies, yeah? Pretty much, yeah, pretty much. Uh, pretty and much. Um, I know from home. <laughs> all, all the guys out there are envious of me, but hey, you know, you can't have it all. I have them all here. But uh, yeah. hey, this is this is true. Okay, so your mental <laughs> mental health has been shaky, to say the least. Is that a, <laughs> to say the least? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Which is how I agree to this. <laughs> yeah, there you go. It makes perfect sense. Oh man, I feel free. I feel free, and I hope. Yeah, I hope the situation because I, I, you know, just leaving, just like having like in laws. I think it's probably like uh, too much already, right? Especially the condition of a new baby. Yeah, I mean, it's like everything else, quite frankly, I feel the same way, not even necessarily about my in-laws, but it would be the same with my parents. Uh, they're great mm -hmm. f uh, in in just, you know, short periods of time. Right, so right, you have right. them in for like a week, oh, wonderful, perfect, everyone's happy, the kids are happy, you're happy, everything is great. Right. You get to that like week and a half, two weeks mark, all of a sudden it gets a bit like, <sighs> all right, all right. Uh. But Okay. <laughs> I mean, just that's like not it. how you spread butter on a bread. God ah. damn it. It's <laughs> pretty funny. I, that's a bit there, right there. I think the little <laughs> thing's going to get you. And uh, yeah, it was, it was, uh, I think I kind of want to go into a bit more of the, you know, the background of getting the comedy and what we're kind of doing. Sure. At the, uh, but I want to also kind of talk about something present, like the coronavirus situation. Cause you were, you know, you were basically yeah. under lockdown and uh, quarantine for a couple of weeks. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's and maybe exactly tell right. me a bit more about that. Um, I mean, it's basically affected me uh, pretty much like every other every other person who's involved in in comedy or in general in events here, um, which means that the, the whole business essentially imploded. Right? There's no mm -hmm. if there's no bars, no restaurants we can go to to uh, create events, to create comedy events. There's no one booking you for any mm -hmm. events because there are no events. So uh, it's just a matter of uh, trying to figure out what do you do in your spare time. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you what do you find is a creative outlet? That's a great thing about comedy. I mean, it is a writer's profession. So mm -hmm. you still write. Um, I mean, I guess it's the same with you. We have our regular sessions yeah. as well on, on writing sessions online and all this stuff. So we continue to do that. But at the same time, um, it is, you do feel that itch. There's definitely something missing. Right. Right? There's no but, stage you can go to. Um, and at a certain point, mm -hmm. even your in-laws basically say like, okay, we've had enough of this. Uh, we can't right. have you on this stage in the living room just get off right, right, right. performing of mind as well private shows for the family but i, I was also kind of like thinking Basically, i'm gonna get thrown out of my own house <laughs> this is what's happening aggressive. i mean because no one can stand me luckily summer is coming yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> no but I, I wanted to talk a bit more about like uh you know so basically with for those that don't know like the berlin comedy scene actually had a, a, a potentially a, a comedian with corona right oh yeah yeah sorry yeah, so, yeah, that's so maybe true. you can go um, a bit more in detail about that Sure. Uh, so what happened is, uh, so we all have sort of a bunch of different uh, events that we do. One of the things that I do is uh, an open mic that I run every Monday called Laughing Spree. And um, so we had a lineup that was, I think, the 2nd of March, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. So very early March. And a um, couple days later or a week later, we basically get an email or, or message in the group message in the Facebook chat um, where that person basically said, hey, I've been in contact with someone who tested positive for Corona, so you might want to get tested as well. It was the classic uh, chlamydia call. Um, <laughs> listen, you might want to get tested. 
And uh, so what happened to all of us then is we all uh, self-isolated uh, who were on that show mm -hmm. and then exactly tried to get tests. And that was a very interesting procedure because what we all found at that point, at least, so this is very early March, is it's really difficult to get, it was really difficult to get tested at that point. Mm -hmm. um, because just saying, hey, listen, I've been in contact with someone who was in contact with someone who tested positive. They basically went like, well, if you don't have any symptoms, Mm -hmm. come back when you do mm -hmm. and that was a bit puzzling to me especially mm -hmm. at that early stage where you really want to have contact tracing in place where it's even more relevant than it is now um lucky unlucky for me what happened for me uh, i was at the hospital because um, my uh, kid was already born at that point yeah um, what, what was the timing I exactly went, I, thought, I thought the timing was good for this oh, okay so, so what happened is my uh, girlfriend showed some early signs already of uh, um, contractions and that was the, the week before mm -hmm. and her parents were coming in on the Saturday. So was, she's kind of holding it in. So I was like, uh, oh, this baby's not coming out. This baby's not coming out. So her parents arrived. I picked them up from the airport. And then on that very day, contractions got, start getting more intense. Um, we get to the hospital, baby comes out in a matter of like less than an hour. It's insane. Uh, this is crazy how quick this was. All right. So it comes out two days later. Uh, so this was Saturday. Then it was Monday. I get the message. Um, and at that point, again, I'm still in the hospital. So I go to the emergency room, basically tell them, okay, here, mm -hmm. listen, I've got this message. I might want to get tested. Again, they told me like they told a couple of the others in the group, well, if you don't really have any symptoms, uh, we don't really want to test you. And I told right. them, well, listen, I'm here. In the newborn station, I'm, I'm staying here in the hospital for now. Um, this is probably a bad idea because if, if I am positive, that means everyone will get it, right? right? And at that point, we hadn't really canceled all our events yet. So my mm -hmm. other argument was, listen, I also um, literally in touch and very close proximity with hundreds of people every week. Mm -hmm. So I'm the perfect person <laughs> to basically right, right. be ground zero in Berlin. So please test me right. and then that convinced them i got tested and then i self-isolated in a in a hotel because mm -hmm. i didn't want to be close i mean at that point it was already too late anyway but mm -hmm. just in case i didn't want to be too close to my family so i self-isolated till i got the test results in a hotel and um uh eventually was negative and at that point i was like ah oh, this is actually not good i wish i was positive <laughs> stay more <laughs> in the because <laughs> at that point that would have meant that i would have been with it for two mm -hmm. weeks already which means if i was positive right. at that point i would have at least been immune right, right. but um i didn't have any symptoms or anything anyway so I, and it was particularly was scary i'm assuming because you just had like a newborn right that's exactly right. Uh, obviously, at that point, I was super worried about my kid as well as my girlfriend because um, mm -hmm. the classic uh, immunosuppressed at that point, right. you know, just after giving birth and being newborn. So, yeah, I was, I was quite worried. It was scary times. Um, but, uh, and then also in the hotel, I was really completely by myself, but despite right. the fact that I have family and I have a lot right, of right, right. here at the moment, right. um, I was completely by myself as, as much as we were chatting mm -hmm. and doing everything, you know, the WhatsApp and everything, it was still uh, uh, really rough and it was sort of uh, running up the walls right, 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 right. to do with myself. And um, yeah, it Which was... It's a pretty insane time, and it's, it continues to be. <laughs> it's, it's, it's crazy, man. Like, I, I, like I, from what we've been talking like this whole past month, it sounds like completely insane. But first of all, congratulations on the newborn. You're, you're a small little girl. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> appreciate that. Yeah, appreciate uh, it. Yeah, yeah she's it, a cutie. Insane times, man. Like, so for example, with this, like, uh, so, you know, the self-isolation, the hotel, did you, did you have to pay for that yourself or was there any particular government? Yes. Help? Okay. No, no, there was no government. No, I just paid for it myself right. and uh, it was okay. I mean, I, right. I, I chose a cheap hotel obviously, right, right. Um, to make it all right. And then I tried to do that thing where I basically ordered stuff, like ordered mm -hmm. food and basically told right, them right. all, well, just leave it in front of the door right, 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 right. <laughs> and then okay. run, run right, you right, fools. Right, right. Um, uh, yeah, so it's interesting. My, my sister kind of flew back from the UK like last uh, two weeks ago. And basically mm -hmm. they, this time around, because all the flights are kind of stopped, you know, obviously this is like early April. They actually right. did not let her uh, have contact with anybody. They put her directly in the quarantine, even though she didn't have corona, but they didn't know yet. Right. So they kind of put her in a hotel. Right. And the Romanian government paid for the hotel, if you can believe that. Um, so that was an interesting situation. Wow. Okay. It's only if I was asparagus. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to the asparagus situation soon because I've been right. Uh, but yeah, tell, let's talk a bit more about how did you get into comedy and like how long have you been in the game as a per se? Sure. Um, so I've done comedy. So maybe if you don't look at it specifically, stand up comedy, I've done comedy for about, was it now? 
14, 15 years, something like that. Um, because I did uh, comedy in German previously. So when I was just fresh out of school, uh, I did a bit of sort of theater, youth theater, uh, a couple of groups, uh, a group of friends of mine. And we, we started our own cabaret group. So cabaret is a little different here in Germany than it might be in, in other places. If you're listening to this from a more sort of Anglophile uh, mm-hmm. perspective, mm-hmm. Um, it's not... Uh, just sort of uh, uh, sexy girls uh, and sexy men mm-hmm. in <laughs> sclam outfits uh, 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 dancing and singing. Um, it's mostly ugly men in wigs dancing and singing. No, it's it's more sort of a, a topical mm-hmm. sketch based. Some a lot of times political version of of stand up, mm-hmm. but it's sort of sketch based in a way. So I think of it as Monty Python, but instead of being very very silly it's very sort of mm, no i gotta educate right, right, right. About or about the people. rhetoric then yeah it's a lot more about rhetoric and that also uh, makes it very different to to stand up in mm-hmm. that uh, the rhythm is very different mm-hmm. like uh, i think the music an- analogy is always quite nice where it's sort of like uh, a cover it is, is is like uh, jazz mm-hmm. very like dun, 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 a lot slower dun, mm-hmm. dun, 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 and then uh, stand up is like rock and roll right uh, right right cool it's hip uh, and, and it's great and um so i did that for a while did about four or five years and then i moved abroad i uh, mm-hmm. moved to england and i realized very quickly because i was just basically trying to translate the stuff that i did right. in cabaret in german to to english and i realized very quickly that uh, nobody likes jazz and right. <laughs> so i transitioned to stand up which uh, was all right because i was already a big fan of of classic uh, stand-up with like uh I was a big fan at the time of uh, George Carlin, Richard mm-hmm. Pryor, Bill Moore. So mm-hmm. my cupboard actually already was a bit stand up y. So right, all right, the right, monologues right. that I did within our stand up programs um, were already kind of stand up y. Mm-hmm. So the transition wasn't as hard for mm-hmm. me. Uh, but from that point on, I was like, okay. It's stand up then. Stand up in English. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what I want to do. And even when I traveled further to, to Mexico and eventually came back uh, mm-hmm. to Germany, I was like, no, I, I want to continue doing this. Instead of going back to, to German, I want to continue getting better at this mm-hmm. in English and um, see what it goes. Well, what, was the, so, what was the reason why you wanted to continue in English? Because like, you know, actually in terms of, I know, you know we, we've kind of spoken about this before, but in terms of like future yeah. career progression, you know, cabaret surprisingly has like, you know, potentially you can make a lot of money. There's a lot of... Yeah. Uh, potential you know industry for it in germany sure absolutely so um at the time the reason obviously was i was in england <laughs> so mm-hmm. i yeah. had to do it in english yeah, so yeah, there, yeah. there was not a lot of demand uh, for german comedy right. in england surprisingly enough <laughs> and uh, as soon as i got back to uh, germany and to berlin the reason was again uh, primarily it was mm-hmm. um I just want to get better at this. I just want to stick with this. It also, I get more enjoyment out of it, number mm-hmm. one. And then number two, as soon as I saw that some people who did it in English transitioned to German and they actually, I saw the career opportunities. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're right, we're talking about this. What I was thinking is, sure, you could do that and probably get a, a much quicker career, career progression transitioning there, but then you limit yourself very mm-hmm. much to mm-hmm. the uh, German-speaking realm. So mm-hmm. what you're going to end up doing is, you're then confided to Germany, Switzerland, mm-hmm. Austria, essentially. Mm-hmm. And I was like, no, I, I'd rather do English because it gives me much broader appeal. I can start touring in Europe, uh, the rest of these countries. And again, it's a personal decision for me, really. Right. So uh, it's more I just enjoy it more. International, okay, enjoyability and international appeal. Okay. Yeah, pretty much. And then uh, yeah, I know you also kind of went, spent a bit of time in Mexico. Uh, did you manage to do anything like that there? Um, very few things. I think I did two gigs while I was there. So mm-hmm. there was one in this uh, small, smaller touristy town, Playa del Carmen. And I ended up, they had like a little club that did like an English show every blue moon. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I did one there and then I did another one in Mexico City. Uh, there was another like open mic type of thing that just went up. Um, but no, yeah, the, the demand for English speaking comedy in Mexico is also not extremely high. Right. <laughs> they, they all got Netflix, so they don't really need uh, a bunch of foreigners. Okay. Like, how, do you, how did you feel about it? I mean, uh, you obviously, um, you don't do a bunch of stand-up comedy in Romanian. So how, how, what's your thoughts about this? I mean, the stand-up sure comedy... If you started doing it in Romanian for the Romanian market, there would also be uh, uh, quite a bit of demand for that. 
I mean, to be honest, I've kind of been thinking about it because like, you know, at the moment I'm thinking about with regards to like growing audience. And uh, so I'm in the position where at the moment I am having like a bit of growth in subscribers on YouTube from uh, there. Are, a lot of them are basically just coming from TikTok. Um, mm-hmm. And the, the way that I don't know, the way that TikTok works is I just put up uh, you just the discovery mechanism is quite interesting on TikTok because basically what they do is you can see you can see a lot of content per minute. Right. So you, let's say you can potentially right. see up to like maybe three to four clips per minute, right? From different kind of people. And it's not like you don't need to have a yeah. feed. You don't need to have a curated anything. It's basically kind of, I understand that they, they just should just throw it up there, see what sticks. Yeah. And then basically, so they give you like two good ones, one shitty ones. And then you basically kind of curate it by saying, I like it or don't like it. By not taking any action, then you curate it as being shit, right? Um, right. From what I understand is the way that they kind of show your content to other people is they look at your age and they look at your nationality or uh, point of origin, maybe like from the mm-hmm. data of, of the of the phone uh, and then basically they try to match or oh, because oh, no, you, you log in with Facebook right so they take all this information from Facebook so they have an idea of your profile and then what they do is they oh, you don't to, have your own sorry you don't have your own profile on TikTok like it's I mean I have it from Facebook you, you, you can do the login with Facebook thing right oh okay I see. yeah so then they, they in the back end they managed to pull some uh, data on like your persona like you know where are you from originally whatever so right. then Based on that, they show your content to people that have a similar profile to you. So what's been happening mm-hmm. is I've been putting my stand up on there and it's been showing my content to a lot of people in Romania. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, it's English comedy and some bits are about Romania. And, you know, one, one video got about 120,000 views, right? Um, mm-hmm. But then what happens is a lot of these people are actually, oh, it's, this is pretty, un, uh, it's very new and it's very like, they're not used to seeing this a Romanian guy talking in English. You know, my English is relatively good as well. So that I'm getting a lot of followers. I got about like 3,400, almost 4,000 followers just organically, right? So right. then uh, the and idea- most of them are Romanians. Is yeah, I mean, yeah, the majority mm-hmm. of them I would say Romanians. And there is also some degree of like maybe Balkan uh, type of people. Because mm-hmm. I actually right. got a message from a guy from Vienna who's a Serbian dude. And he runs like a Serbian restaurant. He's like, hey man, I saw your content on TikTok. He messaged me on Instagram. I want to, you know, come, come over and do a show at my restaurant, right? Mm. Uh, so that was okay. I'm getting business for TikTok, but then obviously that's kind of like oh, this is the start of March is happening. So you know it's, we have to wait. Mm-hmm. For it kind of throws up. <laughs> but, the, but the point is, yeah, the people do like it. But you know, if you compare it to other Romanian content made in Romanian, that's getting more mm-hmm. traction. Right? So I think if I were to do right. stuff in Romanian, I would get more traction in Romania. But again, yeah. the problem is uh, it's a couple of it's a couple of points. Like you know, I don't live in Romania. I can't really identify with the zeitgeist that is Romania. A lot of the current topic at the moment, I, I'm completely disconnected from the popular culture. Right. So I don't think there's, I don't think it makes point that makes a lot of sense in terms of just focusing on that market. Yes, I could probably progress faster, especially since like I have a lot of experience in comedy. It's going to take me like a couple of months to just kind of kick back into the Romanian right. life. Because I guess I, you know, having not spoken it for a while, my timing is a bit off, I've noticed. Mm. Uh, but again, the problem is that you know, there's two, 22 million Romanian maximum in the world, right? So like in terms of market size, it's not. Yeah. But having said that, there are, I was looking at one of the Romanian uh, comedians, the biggest Romanian comedian uh, has like a podcast. And then one of the, like this week, it was top 10 most listened podcasts in the world. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. The, the guy got like 1.2 million listens for like this interview with another Romanian guy. Uh, hello. Hey. Hey, Carlo. <laughs> so so basically yeah the point was like i want to do like you know again i watch a lot of english comedy and i want to do english like just to have that big market potentially one billion people, mm-hmm. right? right that's my logic with hey it. hello how's it going yeah. one? um so basically yeah i know from that perspective i think it makes more sense to do it in english and i think people kind of have that you know it takes a bit of time to for them to warm it up but it's something new and i think it can create a bit of a it has its own charm i guess right no, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. But the problem is I can't, I can't jack into any of the growth mechanisms that traditional, uh, if you do it in Romanian, you can potentially have a high opportunity to go on Romanian TV or Romanian, whatever. So you get a bigger, you get like yeah. that, that, uh, that what do you call it? The, uh, the megaphone effect, effect right? Other yeah, exactly. People, it's it's a just, whole exposure thing. I mean, yeah, you've you got get, the same exactly. thing here in Germany. I mean, you've talked to other people who did that yeah. transition as well, I'm sure. So it's that whole thing that all of a sudden you get a national platform by being yeah. on television. Yeah. Uh, and you do all of these classic gatekeeper things, right? That, uh, but the question is, I mean, it's obviously still relevant now, and it mm-hmm. probably continues to be mm-hmm. relevant for a number of years. Mm-hmm. But uh, as we've discussed before, uh, um, at, a, at some point, uh, there will be a transition into you need to create content more or less on your own, need to be your yeah. own platform. Exactly. To people, exactly. So I think it's... So, all- so that model... It's not going to last yeah. forever. It's only, I mean, TV is dying. Let's make, let's be serious, right? 
it's, and YouTube is on the rise and, you know, kind of private. And I was listening to like the, the Joe Rogan podcast today with Donald Rowling. He's saying the, the same thing. You have a podcast, you have your own network, you know, you control the content, you don't have censorship, whatever, right? Uh, but anyway, let's go back to exactly. kind of transition to the pro- propaganda stuff slowly. But, uh, you know, so you started off Laughing Spree Comedy. Maybe tell me a bit more about Laughing Spree. How, how, how did that come about? Yes. Um, so yeah, I, I came uh, back to Berlin. I sort of had a look around and I saw, I was very positively surprised that all of a sudden there was this uh, English speaking uh, comedy scene in Berlin, which was amazing. What year was this? When did you come back? In Berlin. Uh, so there was 2016, I think, okay. 2016, so about f- almost, uh, well, three and a half years ago, I think mm-hmm. it was, and, uh, which was great because before I left, there was nothing like that. There was no English scene, there was right. nothing, there wasn't, for stand-up, there wasn't even a German scene. Interesting right. enough, for Berlin, mm-hmm. the stand-up scene got started in English, and then some people, some Germans who would did in English then decided oh we stand up in German could be a thing right, right. Uh, and then started sort of the, the German stand up scene here as well and um, so I got back I was positively surprised that there's an English scene I was like okay well great I'll have a look at a couple of these uh, shows and then I'll just tried myself so right. i then did um the nose mm-hmm. um which uh, which i really liked at the beginning and then this i did uh, still run by mark that was b- run by mark already at that point exactly shout out mark and Beetle. yeah mark Beetle, exactly shout out to him no uh, mark Beetle is fantastic whenever like anyone who's new uh, here mm-hmm. in the city i mean he he's always incredibly encouraging mm-hmm. and uh, very welcoming to anyone so for instance when people ask me at, at my show i always say like definitely try out the nose um it's definitely a very good proving yeah. ground um, for anyone who's new in it anyway so i did a couple other shows and um then as it is you know you start developing friendship with people some people have certain style whatever and um i then after a while sort of decided you know what um to get actually the, the main reason why i started doing is it, it was really stage time i was like mm-hmm. um i do a spot here do a spot there yada 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 but at the end of the day i don't get enough time to really be on stage and really hone my craft mm-hmm. um so so I figured, well, having your own open mic would be a way to do that. Yeah. And then I was talking to two, three people to uh, get one started because I also felt like how much energy I have to put into the production of the thing like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't want to do it by myself because I knew right. immediately, A, I, wanna, I don't want to half-ass it. So mm-hmm. I don't want to just sort of, oh, here's a thing, let's see what happens, but rather mm-hmm. like actually work for it. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I knew if you actually want to put effort into it, mm-hmm. it can it become grating um, after a while if you just do it by yourself and then you just burned out and then what's the point of that because you're right. going to run six, seven months and that's it. Right. So I wanted a partner. I, I talked to a couple of people and ended up uh, with uh, Dave Adams um, who we came up with that show together. So mm-hmm. Laughing Spree in a sense is sort of not just my baby, sort of our baby. Mm-hmm. It's sort of uh, Dave and I came up with that and uh, we, we looked at a bunch of different places. That's the other thing that's always really difficult. Right. Uh, uh, find the right venue. I was right. uh, literally for about a month, month and a half <clears throat> running around one district uh, trying to figure out uh, is there any place mm-hmm. I can put the show at and that would be willing mm-hmm. to, to have us. Right. Because what I did at the time is uh, I was looking at Okay, what are the major districts in Berlin that A, have an expat community, so where are a lot of them living, mm-hmm. and then B, is still somewhat um, touristy, so that it also has an influx of tourists. So you can right, look at right. the official statistics, uh, how many tourists you have per district. So I looked at right. that, and then I figured that Friedrichshain at the time was great mm-hmm. because it, ha- it wasn't number one on all of these right. metrics. It was like always number two, number three, number mm-hmm. four, but there was no show there at the time. So I was right. like, this is actually a perfect, perfect place to do it. And um, then I felt like doing it at a hostel would be great mm-hmm. um, because I felt there would be um, sort of an, an automatic audience with it. Right? right. Because the people from the hostel, you can somehow get them in, which interestingly enough, now in hindsight, at least with where I'm at, that's the least amount of people, I guess. Yeah. yeah <laughs> I barely yeah. get any people from that hostel. Yeah and um or if they come they they don't they're not very generous in donations yeah they're they're not very generous or they're like uh, okay what is this i just wanted to have a beer here okay i'm leaving right right so um but yeah so i felt at the time that would be great because you have this inbuilt audience and um 
Then I was running around to a couple of different hostels. They were all very small in Friedrichshain and most of them like, ah, we don't, either we don't have the equipment or we don't really want to do this, yada, yada, yada. And eventually I was at one place where it's like, oh, this is perfect. They were up for it. They wanted to do it. Mm-hmm. And uh, then at the final meeting where it was like, okay, where are we going to put the place? What are we going to do? How's mm-hmm. it going to look? And they were like, yeah, this is great. It could be in that corner and it'd be there. And it's like, okay, okay. So final thing, what about uh, equipment? Yeah, mm-hmm. we don't really have anything. And mm-hmm. in my head, I was like, oh, okay, so... I got to get a speaker here every month mm-hmm. or every week because I wanted to do it weekly. And I was like, well, I could leave it here so I don't have to carry it around. But yeah, text it up. Blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And then I asked a very simple question in my mind. It was just like a check, you know, mm-hmm. just check mark. Okay, so, so where would the outlets be? Just so I know where to put the stage. Mm-hmm. And I was like, we don't have any power outlets here in what? that room. It's like, what do you mean? Like, How did you have events here before? Oh, it's right. all acoustic, acoustic right. music. right. Uh, okay. And then it was telling me, oh, but we could have this cord. We could have this power cord run through here from the reception through here. And it's like, okay, yeah. this starts starting to sound like a less than ideal. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And it's like, okay, no, I, that's just not going to work. Right. So, and uh, after we basically decided, yeah, it's just not going to work as much as we'd all want mm-hmm. to, it's just not going to work. They were saying, listen, there's this other place that helped us uh, with some f- uh, uh, gamer stuff, some fines that we received. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe just check with them. And that's how I arrived at the floating lounge. Mm-hmm. And at first they were like, yeah, I don't know if we want to do this. Uh, we've had poetry evenings here before that mm-hmm. didn't go very well. And I said, listen, this is very different. Uh, uh, it's a lot more entertaining. Uh, people will come here. They'll be a lot more into it. Let, let's just give it a go. Right. And uh, then you have the classic thing where at the beginning, uh, I always say that to people sort of who, who start out, and it's like the first couple of times are really easy because all right. your friends, all your family, right, come, right, everyone right. comes, they support you. And then you have that bump. After like the third one, then that's typically mm. where it sort of yeah. teeters out. Right. And that's where you see if a show has legs or not. Right. Um, so, I, uh, Dave and I did a lot of work to get people in and credit to Dave's friends because his whole circle of friends that were there mm-hmm. to support us from the very beginning. Mm-hmm. And that's actually how we also convinced them because what we did was a trial period. Right. Said, give us three months, give us right. two, three months. Uh, we'll see how it goes. If it doesn't go well, well, forget about it. If right. it sticks, let's see. And then um, it worked well. We sort of established ourselves uh, uh, with relatively low numbers, but we always had some audience. So it was always nice. And uh, uh, then later on, uh, when Dave went to Australia with his band, I uh, took the thing up by myself mm-hmm. and then sort of changed some things around. Mm-hmm. And now it's been going uh, quite well since. So for the last two years, two and a half years, basically it's been going going quite well. Uh, so I'm really happy with it. Yeah, and, and it's, um, it's been up to like 100, 120 people at times I've seen it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, we're, we're getting to the point where we're also maxing out the, the venue itself. Mm-hmm. Um, even to a point where, where the owner's basically like, it's it's too many people. Like, right, right, it's right. Dam- like he's like, he's, it's damaging the floor. It's like, there's too many people here. Mm-hmm. And it's like, all right, we'll, we'll, we'll figure out a way how to do mm-hmm. it. And um, which is not a problem that we have right now. The right, floors, right. It's a floating lounge are doing the f- great at the moment. The floors are doing great, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the floors are doing fantastic at the Nature moment. Nature is healing, um, yeah. <laughs> it's just healing. They are wooden floors, so it makes sense. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, that's how I started that. And then I started doing a couple of other things because then I did the Berlin Offensive because mm-hmm. I had Nia and Francesco who are sort mm-hmm. of in the similar style of dark mm-hmm. and offensive comedy. Mm-hmm. Uh, similar idea. Uh, we don't have a lot of opportunities to dark offensive comedy because mm-hmm. at the regular open mic, you're always like an odd person out. Yeah, yeah, people yeah. aren't really there for that. People um, pull back, yeah. Um, yeah, people, but I mean, it's always funny because you always get some people are really into it. They right, really right. love it. Right. Um, but then a lot of people are just not. And so we figured, well, let's give them, for those people who want that, let's mm-hmm. give them exactly that. We started the Berlin Offensive. And that's been really, really great. It's been great mm-hmm. to collaborate with those two. Um, but it's also really great to to just have that one outlet where people come in exactly for that. Because mm-hmm. the, the first show we did, people were like, oh, this is really great. You know, uh, it's really dark. We really loved it. Could be darker. Could we be looked darker. at each other okay. like, what? We got like necrophilia, pedophilia. We got all the philias basically covered. We got the Holocaust. We got everything covered. It's like, what do you want from us? Like, Animal what rape. What do you want from us? Have to do. Yeah. Yeah, it's like penguins. Just penguins yeah. raping media baby seven. tigers. I don't know what it was. Babies. But, um, <laughs> we, yeah, we had that as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah. It's, um, but it's great. It's been a great journey with that as well. And then 
sooner or later started going mm. and then sort of you came around as well mm-hmm. to berlin and i think we sort of hit it off yeah. pretty quickly and uh, we realized we can work together quite well right. and um, so we started doing a bunch of other stuff and that's how propaganda comedy came around yeah right? so what is propaganda comedy what is propaganda nice segue well, basically I know, yeah. It's basically our brand uh, where we put um, sort of uh, more international mm-hmm. stuff that's not just uh, relegated to Berlin, right. but sort of more international production. Mm-hmm. So where we put up productions in like Denmark, the Netherlands or other parts of Germany mm-hmm. and also bigger gigs and stuff like that, where we'll put that under that umbrella. Mm-hmm. And then that's a collaboration essentially between you and I. Yeah. And I mean, so far it's been going well, man. I think this is the, the yeah. show I was talking to Oliver about it the other day. Like it's uh, crazy how this kind of thing hit exactly when things were kind of slowly taken off, right? Because we had, yes, we've done that, shows that, in... That, uh, that's such a shame, man. It's such a shame. Yeah. It, it really, it was just getting to the point where yeah. we started building audiences in yeah. a couple of different regions. Mm-hmm. And we're just getting to the point where our cost, our acquisition costs yeah. are getting lower and lower yeah. because yeah. people are like, oh, that's the thing I saw last time and it was mm-hmm. really good. So let's go again. And, and not only and, that, but the comedians well, are actually making some money, right? Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. that's that's the big draw that you want to have with that, yeah. where mm. you get quality con, uh, uh, quality talent, mm-hmm. and you basically tell them, listen, yes, you got to do a little bit here mm-hmm. on your own, but at the same time, uh, uh, what you're going to get out of it is a lot more than if you just stay here in Berlin and do yeah, the yeah. odd, the odd uh, a headliner gig here or there. No, you go on the road with us, and you're going to do a lot more. And so that was a big draw for them, and it worked out for those that we managed to do it for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it worked out really well for them. Yeah. Yeah, and it's about like, and even we show we did like a, we did a two two kind of like Eastern European kind of format uh, evening yeah. in Heidelberg. Uh, you know that we did exactly. that worked out really well financially for both of us, and it was like a super yeah. enjoyable for the audience there, massive kind of draw. Great, yeah. Because uh, it's the same thing with the dark comedy thing. As soon as you have that sort of theme thing mm-hmm. where people come in and they know what they want, they know what they're getting. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's not this black box thing, but you rather have that strong theme mm-hmm. that communicates to people what uh, what the mm-hmm. show is going to be about. Then it's almost always guaranteed to be yeah. a, a pleasure for everyone involved. Yeah. Yeah, and then uh, yeah, look at the idea of setting up that circuit to kind of you know allow people to kind of work out their longer format shows, right? Because I think that's the big yeah. thing that's missing with Europe. There's not a lot of uh, circuit or a lot of kind of like the the the, the the lower, not necessarily lower, but the, just the foundation for, you know, getting better as a comedian long term. I mean, there's essentially no infrastructure. I, I yeah. talked to, to you about it when you arrived and I've talked to other people even before then about that. The whole reason why there's not uh, just a sea, just a wave of, of British comedians just flooding the market here in right. Europe is because uh, there is no infrastructure. There's no one, no bookers, no one here to basically tell right. them, okay, you're going to do this, 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 and this, and this city. We're going to run you through and mm. here's your money that you're going to get out of it. Right. Uh, and they're essentially too too lazy to do it on their own. And yeah. For good reason, because they really don't have to do it. They, they right. just can do a bunch of gigs over there in the UK, and that's great for them. Right. So no one has, or very few people, mm. have the initiative to go out and do it on their own, because again, they don't really have to, which means we are the ones who have to build that right. infrastructure here and, in Europe. And that's essentially what we're doing. And not only that, but like, I think, you know, where there is a bit of an infrastructure, there is actually that flood of uh, British comedians, right? So like, I think there's not yeah. enough support from the, you know, the local European comedians. There's, it's about giving the yeah. opportunity to work material and get some of the, you know, you have like so many states in Europe. What's the point of just having like it flooded with, with British comedians, right? Where they have like already market for themselves. Because the thing is, it's, it's like you pointed out just now, it's disconnected, right? Yeah. So what happens is you will have bigger so in this case sort of sort of the mid tier or mm-hmm. even lower tier british comedians coming in as the experts as the professionals right. and then that will be disconnected from the local talent and in the same way we've had really great uh, world-class talent coming in for years now mm-hmm. uh, in europe and mm-hmm. also in berlin but completely disconnected from any local scene mm-hmm. because it's the big promoters the big music promoters mm-hmm. like life nation and so on right, who've right. brought them through and then basically said well you know we'll just have you get run through here mm-hmm. like what do we need the local scene for that there's no reason to connect any right, of this right, well right. you see in other markets like the uk or the us it's a lot more integrated mm-hmm. so they'll find uh, maybe a local opener maybe not for the very big Right, right, people right. bring their own openers but like for for others uh, they would then have on a local comedian mm-hmm. or they will have it in the local club or, or mm-hmm. so on so there will always be a little bit more integration happening um while here that just wasn't happening and because because a lot of times the promoters that set up shows here they're not necessarily comedians or they're just you music promoters yeah, moving exactly. into music moving into comedy Precisely. for the money right so then they Most have no people basically spotted yeah. a gap in the market yeah. and basically uh, said, well, I, I have the infrastructure myself because I'm yeah. doing all the music gigs. Mm-hmm. I might as well 
run the exact same thing for a couple of comedians. So even right. it's even less headache for me because it's just right. some people with a mic. That's it. Right, right, right. Yeah, exactly. You don't have to worry about like the the whole kind of staff producing it in the back end, right? Did you did it, did it break off exactly. or? Okay, yeah. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, yeah, it was a little little. That's fine. I think it's it's, it's not an issue. So basically, yeah. So that kind of leads us to like uh, the big event that Promogana Comedy was putting on for this May. Yes, that's what right. Was that uh, event? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So as I went, uh, so yeah, we had planned to bring, or oh, we're still doing that actually, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Louis C.K. to Berlin mm-hmm. uh, for the first time. Uh, it will be his first gig in Germany mm-hmm. and here in Berlin. And that was a long time coming. So I've been mm-hmm. talking, to, talking about it with people for over a year now. Mm-hmm. And there were a couple stages last year where it could have happened and it eventually didn't. And then we eventually, we, we made it happen. Mm-hmm. The date was May 20th. Mm-hmm. And then same thing. Now with the whole Corona, corona. situation, boom, uh, put a bit of a, 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 <laughs> a wedge uh, in, into our gears. And uh, so now we have to postpone it. Essentially, right. well, What's happening now is that the event is still happening, but we're going to have to postpone it. It's been a bit of back and forth, essentially, right, with right. Uh, them for ranging the time because obviously they have a whole European schedule so it has to fit right, right. with the tool schedule um, so that the exact date is a bit iffy but it's going to happen at some point early mid next year okay yeah. okay and I think because uh, you know obviously Luis get put up a new special recently so I think you know being exactly. put, putting it later in the like in terms of like a couple of months from now it's going to also got to give an opportunity to work on new material and kind of get the new stuff oh out. yeah that's actually what they, they've already told me that like it's going to be a uh, new material because right. i've already had some people contact me basically mm-hmm. say well i don't know if it's really going to be worth it he just right, 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 um, released, yeah. released this thing i don't want right. to see the same thing but then right. i'm going to have to wait another year mm-hmm. um but if we're all, like the, the show next year is going to be a different show so people right. can enjoy the released special right now, which would have been mm-hmm. most of the show in, right. in May, and I can look forward to to new featured material. Right, and I, I've seen it; it's great. Like if you haven't seen it, check it out. Yeah. But uh, I still haven't. It's, it's ironic. I still haven't watched it. We've talked right. about it a couple of times already, right. and I really look forward to watching it. I just really have the, the time. The amount of time, right? Yeah, and I was, it was difficult to set it up to uh, like in terms of logistics to put it together, the whole kind of uh, coordination, you know. The, uh, the, the venue yes, was quite of big. Course, yeah. Of course it was difficult, but you know, every good thing is, <laughs> it mm-hmm. takes, uh, takes a lot of work because um, you basically, I, I have a partner who mm-hmm. approached me with this. So mm-hmm. this is the uh, a comic soul mm-hmm. people who are based in Norway, who are doing mm-hmm. a lot of those bigger gigs and mm-hmm. they have been doing that already. And so we've been talking about this and um, to, to put this together. So there's a lot of communication happening mm-hmm. between them, mm-hmm. um, between the management of Louis C.K. as well. And then me, I arrange everything here on the ground, mm-hmm. also mm-hmm. with uh, the venue, with the mm-hmm. Mercedes-Benz Arena. Um, and those are all, you know, they're all big entities. They, mm-hmm. They've all been playing in the space for a long time. Mm-hmm. And to be honest, even though I've done a couple gigs, somewhat a little bit bigger than others, um, this is a new scale for me as well. Right, right. So um, there's a lot of <laughs> learnings mm-hmm. happening and I made a couple of mistakes here and there as well mm-hmm. and uh, so it's exciting in that way in terms of mm-hmm. like you learn something you sort of there's this whole new level mm-hmm. that you have to get used to and you have to figure your way out uh, it's a lot of contracts mm-hmm. uh, uh, that you need to figure out it's a lot of legal mm-hmm. stuff that you need to figure out you need to have a support system for that mm-hmm. and um, find ways uh, to make sure that, mm-hmm. <laughs> that you're not getting screwed everywhere um, Definitely, so, yeah, yeah, that's definitely exciting. On, on definitely that. a trial by fire, especially with the current situation. Yeah. Trial by fire, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And it's one of those things where you, you put your chips, uh, yeah. uh, you know, on the line. You put them in, and right. you see, okay, let's let's see if this works. If it doesn't, you're fucked. Uh, but yeah, if yeah. it does work, uh, there's there's a there's a couple of things you can get out of it. Uh, I mean, you have to long-standing relationships with yeah. all the people involved, and uh, um, and for me, quite frankly, it mm-hmm. is exciting to bring a big act like yeah. that uh, to Berlin, who's also never been here. You know, yeah, and of course, I think I, I've got a lot of support from people later on. I mean, obviously, with a controversial person like Lucy right, Gay, right, right, right. you know this. Um, we've also gotten a lot of hate from people who are unhappy yeah, right. that he, he would come to Berlin. Right. Um, but we also that, get a lot that of that he breathes. They are happy that he breathes. Yeah, essentially. Yeah. I mean, quite frankly, I, I do get a lot of the criticisms mm-hmm. um, because, uh, frankly, the, the um, apology he put out there, the apology statement at right. the time. Um, wasn't the best could have been right, better right. for sure um <clears throat> but the, the way i looked at it and the way i look at it is like um uh, whatever you do uh, 
you can't be gone forever. You know what I mean? Like, right, if right. someone repents, and as far as I know, there hasn't there haven't been any news of anything similar happened right. since then. Um, and he, someone who wants to better themselves, um, I mean, you know, they, they have to get a chance but yeah, to, to prove themselves. And they sometimes, want, you know, and sometimes you know, to support as well. And I, and I think, you know, some people have this mentality that they're not sad. They won't be satisfied until he kills himself. You know, <laughs> I think. It, yeah, basically. And, and it's fair enough from their point of view as well for right. them um, to do it. And, and like I said, uh, the other thing is uh, I don't bemoan the fact that there are mm -hmm. people like, oh, poor guy. He has all this hate coming mm -hmm. for him. Quite frankly, a lot of the criticism, criticism he deserves and mm -hmm. he has that coming to him. Mm -hmm. um, um, at the same, that's something he has to live with now, mm -hmm. basically. Whenever he, wherever he goes, there mm -hmm. will be people unhappy. There will be people mm -hmm. across and he has to deal with that the people mm -hmm. who are putting on the gigs like us will have to deal with that and right. that's, uh, that's just the way it is um, but at the same time like I said we've got loads mm -hmm. of messages from people we're so happy mm -hmm. um, not just even necessarily for Louis obviously his fans right. have contacted us and say we're so happy that he's mm -hmm. coming but we've had a lot of people contact us we're so happy that an act like that is right. coming to Berlin so. I think it also kind of shows and legitimizes a bit of the you know the city and the comedy scene and the presence of yeah. uh, an audience, Absolutely. an audience for comedy in Berlin, which is again kind of just uh, sets a potential bar for the other events that we're going to go soon. You know, if if a big act like you know UCK comes and gets that kind of an audience, then potentially yeah. I mean, even the local acts that do comedy in English in Berlin can grow to the point where it's it becomes a reachable dream, a reachable vision exactly. to do a show in the Mercedes Benz Arena in Berlin as a local comedian. Because look, there is an audience. There is an audience that understands English. You know, exactly. as long as you grow and you invest, you can actually get to that point as well. I think a, a big part of that is actually Dave Chappelle, uh, who essentially, at least from the American side, put Berlin on the map because he's right. been, uh, was it last year, the year, the year before, where he's the been here before. like three times? Yeah, the yeah. year before, he's like been here three times. Yeah. Last year was here, uh, he was this here this year as well. Yeah. So from his side, he basically put the city on the map in, yeah. in a way. And we had Anthony Jeselnik here, who right, right. at least through his contacts as well, mm -hmm. kind of let people know, actually, it's mm -hmm. really cool in right, Berlin. Right, right. It's good to be there. Um, so we've had a couple of people mm -hmm. um, sort of establish it as well. And just, just give the... some more Bill Burr coming in yep, yep. and Louis C.K. now. So just give it, give and, it even more credence. And even comedians that you wouldn't say have as, as big of a following in this part of the world, like Tom Segura, yeah. you know, Jim Gaffigan. Uh, you know, G I mean, Absolutely. Jim Jeffries potentially might have a bit more of a following here because he did Mercedes-Benz. But, you know, you have yeah. like the, 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 it literally is a legitimate scene where people know they can make money if they're abroad. And, you know, the idea is just feeds into the ecosystem here in terms of, you know, we've seen, I but think. Even then, the arena is, is a new level from that. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Most people who came here either to the Temple Drome, like Jim Jeffries, yeah. or um, Venti Music Hall, like mm -hmm. Dave Chappelle, and then the arena is just sort of that next step with, up. Like the only this... people that I remember was Kevin Hart who did it. Right. And I think Trevor Noah didn't do it, but he would be another act who could. He's. Yeah, I think he was. He's not coming to Berlin, if I'm mistaken. If I'm not mistaken, he's, no, he's not coming to Berlin. Yeah, yeah he's doing Frankfurt like and Cologne. Cologne, I think. Frankfurt, or something. Yeah. yeah. Interesting the decision there. I think because I think so. This this would be the first arena in Berlin for American comedians, then. Huh? No, no, no. That wouldn't be the case. Like I said, Kevin Hart was here. Oh, okay. And, he did. He did Mercedes Benz. Okay. He did Mercedes Benz, yeah. but again, in terms of even if it's not the first, again, it is still that sort of that new level and, um, for some someone here in Berlin. Yeah, and it feeds into like the you know when more people know about it, and the more people come into our shows, like yeah, the smaller exactly. ones. Yeah, and again, this this points. This is the point I was trying to make in terms of integration. Mm -hmm. As soon as you have that, where mm -hmm. um, while it's actually local promotions, mm -hmm. local comedians, mm -hmm. now you have that thing where people now connect it to, oh. It's it's that big gig. I was at that gig. I really love yeah. that gig. And it's that company does it. Oh, and they also do a lot of like comedy shows here in mm -hmm. Berlin. Well, maybe we'll check that out because yeah. what I want to do is I want to get all these people who are into comedy, who love comedy, who don't normally go mm -hmm. to the other open mics, to the other um, uh, showcases here in Berlin regularly because we do have that market and we have those people coming in and we love them. But there's a lot of them who do enjoy comedy, mm -hmm. who are coming off the us, just don't go mm -hmm. out to gigs. So I... And it's crazy because you, you make all this effort, mm -hmm. right? And uh, we, we do advertisement, do all this stuff. And it's crazy how many of those people, when I talk to them via email or messages, and for instance, now I mm -hmm. obviously have to communicate a lot with them in terms of how does it work mm -hmm. with postponing the date. And it's crazy how many people just basically say, I never knew there were comedy gigs here in Berlin. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and not just in, in regards to Lucy K, because I always tell them, hey, and don't worry. In the meantime, till then, right. why don't you check out 
our showcases, check mm -hmm. out these open mics, and we're not the only ones. There's others right, who do right. it. There's a vibrant scene here in Berlin. I mean, comedy and in English. A lot of reaction has been, and a lot of the reaction has been like, really? There's yeah, yeah. comedy shows in English uh, in Berlin? I never knew. And this is the thing that I've noticed as well. Even a lot of the open mics that we've been doing, even though I've been doing it for a couple of years, there are still people coming to the show and they're like, oh, it's my first time at a comedy show. And, you know, they've been, we've been running yeah. shows. It's like, you know, it's like, at the, I think at the high point, there were about 40 shows happening uh, a week, right? Yeah, yeah. And every week you would have people come in. This is my very first time at a comedy yeah. show, you know? And uh, so there, my point is there is this market in Berlin mm -hmm. of people staying in Berlin uh, who are just completely untapped. And mm -hmm. I think doing those kinds of gigs will mm -hmm. help us integrate them and get them to all the shows. And then essentially everyone benefits because yeah. obviously they're not just going to come to our shows. Yeah, but yeah. as soon as they're hooked and they see, oh, these other shows mm -hmm. are really cool as well, they'll start going to everyone's shows here yeah. in Berlin. And then eventually that kind of paves the path forward for the local comedians to kind of be yeah, able absolutely. to build. It paves the path for a more yeah. professional scene as well yeah. with uh, more paid gigs. Uh, people can start living off of it because mm -hmm. as soon as that pie grows, mm -hmm. uh, there's more money in it. And when there's more money in it, uh, then mm. people can actually start living off of it properly. There's a few people yeah. who can already, very few. Yeah. Um, but even then, it's not great living, basically. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, as soon as a little bit more money like that comes in, mm. uh, it just creates more opportunities. For yeah, and it's a better time. I think, you know, even with like uh, stuff like the wall opening and you have like more, like, you know, the elements of infrastructures are coming into place, right? Which is, which is very exciting. Right. Um, okay, anything else you want to kind of go over? Like, what do you think, uh, what do you think the scene is going to look like after the, the, the whole kind of pandemic clears over? When will, will you have any thoughts on when it will clear? We have no idea when we'll be back yet because yeah. uh, they, they haven't made any announcement. The only thing they said is that uh, 30th of April is when they'll talk about it. Mm. And then we have no idea because obviously most of our gigs are happening. We were very much dependent on bars, uh, right. restaurants, on, on the, the small venues that we hold these shows at right. because there aren't really any comedy clubs. Um, right, we right, have right. the one uh, Foster's uh, Wall Comedy Club and that's essentially a bar, which means they're right. under the same regulation. Right. And uh, So we're all dependent on that and there's been no indication from the German government yet when mm -hmm. that will happen. So we're all waiting for the 30th of April. Mm. Um, but they've already said large-scale events, nothing happening at least till September um so so all the things that because we we've been talking about it you and i have been talking about it for a while to getting to that mid-tier level right um it's like don't just do gigs here for 50 people right, 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 60 right, right. 100 people here there we want to do 200 and 300 people you want to break it and just to give you an idea you like uh, break it because it's economies of scale right yeah, and, uh, and, you do the same product for 50 people mm -hmm. okay yes but you did the exact same thing for 200 people, all of a sudden it starts making sense. And uh, let's not forget that a, a, like a normal sized comedy room in the US is 400 people, you know? Uh, exactly, that's the other yeah. thing. That's exactly right. So, so we've been kind of spinning a wheel also sort of at this level for a while. And one of the things that we try to do as well with this whole propaganda mm -hmm. comedy is at least for ourselves, but also for others, um, just start getting to a new, to a new yeah, level. Sort yeah. of, uh, really more break into or, that show that exactly. it's possible to put on a show for like and you guys have done it with the uh, berlin offensive to some degree right and like yeah. uh, that was like you did it at the with the theater was it uh um that was the theater exactly. yeah was what was the, the capacity for that i did that i did that with, so that has 220 people i did mm -hmm. that once for ugliku daxen the icelandic comic mm -hmm. and that worked out really well so i i keep contact with those guys mm -hmm. And so then I figured, why don't we do one of either premiere mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. a season finale there? We, mm -hmm. in the end, we decided for the premiere and we did our season premiere for this year, mm -hmm. uh, for this season, I should say, it was last year, um, there. And it turned out, uh, turned out great. It was absolutely fantastic. So mm -hmm. we're definitely thinking about doing that again as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's one of my dreams that I want to do as well. For instance, with you, mm -hmm. as well as Daniel and Tyrone, mm -hmm. that we start doing gigs in a venue like that. It doesn't necessarily have to be Teatrum. I mean, that, right, that was right, my right. proposal to you guys right, right, right. to do it there because we have the connection already. Right. It's a known space for us. Um, but essentially start doing that where, where we're going to these types of gigs. We put them together, put on great shows, mm -hmm. um, but don't do great shows for 40, 50, mm -hmm. even 100 people, but do it for 200 people, do mm -hmm. it for 300 people. Because the shows, uh, the ones that we put up, um, they are already, I think a lot of them are at the level, uh, mm. at the professional level where we put in so much care in the way we craft mm. the environment, we craft the show itself, mm -hmm. it has a production value already mm -hmm. where it definitely deserves to be seen by 200, 300 people and 100% uh, agree, yeah. Paid for the show. Yeah, I do we, think we, like the, the yeah. quality of the comedy has been going up and if you can see the fact that there's so yeah, much stage time available exactly. in Berlin, uh, the 
quality even more than that, because that's what I've been saying for a while with all these shows that we do. It's not just the quality of the comedy, because that that's obviously is very mm-hmm. important mm-hmm. as well, because that's the essential product. Right. But in the end, it has to be a show. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like if if it's just slapped together, yeah, yeah, got yeah. great comics at a showcase. I mean, that's great because the comedy mm-hmm. is great, but at right. the same time, it's it's not really a show, and people feel like there's there's something missing here. So you have right, to right, put right. in a lot of care into how do I make this feel like an actual show? How right, do I right, communicate right. at right. every point? Mm. At the entrance, how right. people are coming in, the look of it, the look of right, the right, theater, right. the look of everything. Like everything has to feel like this is mm-hmm. worth the money I paid for. Right. Okay. And, and then that's exactly. And then as you kind of invest more and more, people are going to be more willing to pay more for better quality shows and better, inv- better the experience, right? And this is one thing that I was... <laughs> Uh, exactly. Kind of, I was listening to a podcast recently from the Airbnb with the Airbnb founder, and he was saying that you know actually what we found out from this particular pandemic that is a lot of work can be done in your house, right? And you can work from home and whatever. So his particular, because you know they've raised like a, another billion dollars now for the future. You're saying that what he thinks is going to happen in the next couple of months and after the pandemic is so you know people are going to realize stuff can be done in house in terms of work, but then it's going to be a, a you know a reversal. Do less uh, less work outside. And do more fun outside, right? Uh, right. Reverse right. entertainment, reach into the house and go out for experiences out in the world, right? Like travel, exactly. uh, you know, the Airbnb experience kind of situation going on. A comedy as well is, a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an experience, right? It's an entertainment experience outside of your house. That's exactly right. And, and I find that tricky in terms of timing, for instance, because right. I feel like, and uh, I think we all kind of have that feeling mm-hmm. that as soon as we're getting back, everyone will be wild. Everyone just wants yeah, to yeah, see yeah. something, wants to have experiences. Yeah. So I think there's going to be a boom. Sort of as soon as we're coming back, mm-hmm. there's going to be, if it's during the summer, because the summer normally is a bad time uh, right. for comedy historically, there's going to be at least two, three weeks, in my opinion. And it's going to be booming because everyone is right. back. Everyone just wants to see something. They want to experience right, right, right. Uh, social the, activities and all that. Overcompensate. Um, but, but then, the, exactly, overcompensate. So you, then there's going to be a lot of drug overdose. It's a great time of opportunity, but if it's during the summer, it'll teeter out, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's now is sort of important is figuring out when mm-hmm. will that time be to, to, to make sure you can take advantage of that opportunity, but at the same time, prepare yourself and position yourself mm-hmm. uh, for later on when, when the season so to speak actually Mm -hmm. picks up again which i would say maybe around september or so um september october Mm -hmm. uh be in a position to to really get back and create quality content quality experiences at that point and that's sort of what we're trying to do now um where we're like using this time now Mm -hmm. to prepare for that basically set up everything and and but again, it's it's time. We don't know if yeah, that's yeah. even going to be available at that time. Mm-hmm. Will it be a couple of months later? Biggest problem. Will yeah. the restrictions be? Because whenever we come back, um, even with the bars and everything, there mm-hmm. will be restrictions in place. They already said you have to have some kind of hygiene plan in right. place that takes into account the social distancing, that takes into account masks and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. So all of this stuff, as important as it is for our health, from our perspective, all of that is obviously counterproductive to the feel know. at a comedy show. That's all know. about. A social event because a it's comedy gonna, show is all about enjoying this thing together communally right right, right. and uh, i mean uh, that'll make it very very hard uh, and this is what we've talked about like you know seeing a show live versus seeing a show on netflix completely different experience right completely different like you know you go in the room it's it's like the euphoria of everyone else kind of like just kind of like enjoying it it's, it's the feed of everyone else's energy yeah, as well yeah, it's a yeah. whole thing that we experience together yeah. it's an aesthetic experience right yeah. it's an aesthetic experience that happens in the moment on top right. of that life company feeds of the audience in a way mm-hmm. that we the audience and the comedians are creating something together, which mm. is not happening when you're watching something Netflix. I mean, I'm sure most people have had that experience where you watch a Netflix special and as great as it is, you'll have mm. a couple of chuckles, mm-hmm. maybe a snort here or there, but you don't have that same laugh out loud, laughing all yeah, the time yeah, yeah. consistently that you have in the comedy club, even if the jokes are maybe not even as good as they right, are right, right, right. with the Netflix special. Because again, you are enjoying it on a different level. You're enjoying it together with other people. Right, right. Yeah, then that's that's yeah. exactly what it is. Um, okay, so uh, I think we can kind of wrap it up for now unless you want to add something yeah. else. Uh, well, thanks. Um, Go ahead. Yeah. No, I think we've pondered enough. Uh, we, yeah, I, I think, think we, we, we've found the goal. We've met the goal. We've been mm-hmm. unfunny about comedy for about an hour. Perfect. So I think we've done it. We did it. Well uh, done. Yeah. So if anyone wants to check out some of the shows, go to Propaganda Comedy on Facebook. Uh, also yeah. sign up for the mailing list. You guys get the notifications there. That's going to yes, be... Yes, we've got a website, propagandacomedy.eu. 
Yeah, and also you get uh, discounts for some of the shows if you sign up on the mailing list. Uh, yeah, Good. so then let's see. Uh, oh, with regards to the Louis C.K. show, has there been a date so set up yet? Just to kind of close that particular loop in? Uh, sorry, it just cut out a little bit. Can you say with that again? To the Louis C.K., is there a date uh, for now? Uh, we don't have a confirmed date just yet. Um, we're looking at, um, uh, at this point, February, March next year, okay. 2021. Um, we're still waiting for the exact date confirmed because, again, it needs to be in line with all the other dates that they're, uh, um, that they're putting together for Europe. So apparently uh, Kiev, uh, they've got two sold out shows there, mm-hmm. and that apparently is a little bit more difficult to, to get aligned with all the other dates in right. the Nordic and in, in Germany right. with us. So we're waiting for that. Uh, as soon as we have it, we'll let everyone know. So basically all, everyone who is a ticket holder, like if you're listening mm-hmm. to this and you are a ticket holder of the show, we'll let you know as soon as we find out. I already sent uh, on Eventbrite, I sent a message to everyone mm-hmm. letting them know this is the situation, right. Right. waiting for the confirmation. The show will definitely happen. And um, that's exactly what it is. The show will be happening. It will be happening next year. We're just mm-hmm. trying to figure out what exact date. Okay. Well, uh, congratulations once again on setting up the show. Uh, congratulations on your new board. And uh, yeah, Thank stay you. safe. Thanks for being on the podcast. We'll, yeah, uh, likewise. likewise. Uh, stay safe and healthy. Stay sane. Which stay is, sane, I that is exactly yeah. one of the, the important ones to wish people these days. This is and indeed. then yeah, it was great, great talking to you as always. Okay, awesome. Uh, All right. See you later, guys. Have a great day.